So good morning. Thanks for joining us for the CTLT Spring Institute session on Walking the Talk, Sharing Our Practices, Engaging with Indigenous Initiatives. My name is Janie Liu, and I'm the Senior Educational Consultant within Indigenous, uh, the Indigenous Initiatives team at CTLT. And my co-hosts for today's session are Amy Perot, who's the Senior Strategist for Indigenous Initiatives, Erin Yoon, who's the Educational Consultant for Classroom and Campus Climate, and Sue Hampton, the Educational Consultant within our TLPD, our Teaching, Learning, and Professional Development team. I'm joining this session from my living room in East Vancouver on the unceded and stolen lands of the Coast Salish people, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil tooth First Nations. And I would also like to begin by acknowledging with gratitude and commitment the relationship our CTLT Indigenous Initiatives team has with the Musqueam First Nation, on whose lands the UBC Point Grey campus occupies. Our work benefits so much from this relationship and the guidance of Musqueam uh, through, for instance, the participation of Musqueam community members on our Indigenous Initiatives and Classroom Climate Faculty Advisory. And I'd also like to add that in appreciation of that relationship, it's important to honor and amplify the messages that Musqueam has shared with the UBC community over time. And one of those messages is that everyone has a responsibility to learn about Musqueam and Indigenous, non-Indigenous relationships and truth and reconciliation. And that this responsibility is not just for Indigenous people to hold, um, but it is really for any one of us, um, including settlers to, uh, also carry, and it, especially for settlers, we cannot expect Indigenous people to teach us all the time. And I really was thinking about this uh, in relation to, day, to today's panel and the themes of our session and discussion today. As a second generation Chinese Canadian and a settler on these lands myself, it's been an ongoing learning and unlearning journey for me to understand my own relationships with settler colonialism and how to integrate decolonization and reconciliation into my practices within classrooms and also as an educational developer within the university. I'm also thinking a lot this week, and I'm sure many of you are as well, about recent events um, that have highlighted settler colonial violence. For example, the discovery of uh, the remains of 215 um, children at the Kamloops, uh, former Kamloops Indian Residential School site, um, and the recognition that there are so many calls for additional um, inquiry into other sites, um, which, are, which are stories that have been shared by survivors for a long time, and that these events are heavy. We also have had other acts of racial violence recently, um, including the um, murder of uh, a family in London, Ontario this last week. And I feel as though these events are heavy in our hearts. And I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge them at the start of our session today. Um, I feel as though when, when you start to do this work and our panelists will, will talk about their commitments to uh, doing this work in their teaching and learning, um, it can be really distressing and overwhelming. And yet it is trying to show up every day and um, hold each other up, but also taking moments like this to pause and reflect and feel uh, what has happened and the why of why we do this work. So I just quickly wanna introduce um, what the event will look like today. We have a panel of um, three speakers and these are uh, three members of what we call the Indigenous Initiatives Learning Community. And the learning community um, is a group of folks who are actually uh, people who have completed what we call the Indigenous Initiatives Design Series. Um, when we started, uh, when I started my role at CTLT, there were in increasing calls to uh, indigenize curriculum. And one of the things that we eventually uh, began to program was a series of workshops to support uh, instructors who were interested in integrating indigenous content in their courses, but perhaps were not experts um, centering their work on that, those fields. And so we created this series. And then afterward, what we found is that people who took the series ended up taking it sometimes more than once. And we're looking for more ways to connect with one another. And so we created this learning community, uh, which has been really a joy to, to work with over time. 
when uh, we all did our pivot to remote work last year due to COVID, um, there are lots of threads that were dropped and people sort of dispersed and, uh, you know, were working on their own things. But over the last year, uh, we certainly have recognized that the need for this kind of work has not decreased, uh, but the connections have been harder to come by. And uh, over time, we sort of slowly started to come back together. And uh, we've learned about some of the work that Ben and Catherine and Leanne have done. And when it came time to um, think about Spring Institute sessions, what we decided to do was it would be great to highlight some of that work and perhaps weave some of these threads together again, and hopefully find some light and inspiration in the stories that we have to share about this practice of continually walking the talk. Um, I'm gonna say one more thing about the panel before I turn it to my colleague, Amy, who's going to introduce the panelists. Um, we're gonna go through all three panelists who are gonna share some stories with us. And as we do so, um, we're gonna ask you to hold your questions for the Q&A until the end. But uh, what we've done is we've created a Padlet and one of my colleagues hopefully will um, put that link into the chat. And what you can do is if you have a question for a specific panelist or a thought to contribute uh, that you want to reflect to the panel, that you just want to remember and you don't want to get distracted while you're listening to the other panelists, feel free to just uh, click on the plus sign in the bottom right hand corner of that Padlet. And you can just type your question uh, for all of us so that we have a little bit of a note board at the end that we can look at and we can start our questions um, in that place. So. Without further ado, I'm gonna pass it on to my colleague, Amy Perot, who is going to introduce a little bit more about the panel and our panelists. Awesome, thanks, Janie. Tanshi, bon matin. Good morning, everybody. Hello, I'm so glad you are here. Um, our panel today is about walking the talk as faculty who are engaging with Indigenous initiatives in their practices. And I was thinking about my words this morning and how I'd love to introduce this amazing group of folks. I would also like to add to the mix, showing up is probably another phrase that I, that I would use to describe um, these colleagues. Um, this amazing panel um, has been showing up over the years and it's been a pleasure to get to know each and every one of them. Um, Catherine, I met when I first started at CTLT um, and the Indigenous Initiatives team was formed. And uh, I met Catherine as part of when she was attending the Classroom Climate Series. And that was in the early days, so like 2011. And she's been showing up ever since. Um, Leanne and I met in 2013 when the TRC West Coast event was coming to Vancouver. And I'm not sure if others in the room have been at UBC that long or have memories of that, that really pivotal time in UBC's history where we canceled classes for the day and we began thinking about how to engage in these issues in a meaningful way. And Leanne has been showing up ever since, um, whether that's through our programming, the design series, or it's popping into the virtual coffees this past year and sharing her knowledge with other people in that space. And then Ben has attended a number of our workshops. Um, and I recall really getting to know Ben in one of the early iterations of the Indigenous Initiatives Design Series in 2017. And since then, I've had the chance to really connect with Ben, work with him. Um, ben, you've been just so generous in sharing about your work, um, engaging with Indigenous students and, and their perspectives and how their experiences are being embedded and represented in, in your department. And so I'm really honored just to um, now go into the formal bio introductions, everybody, but I really wanted to provide those grounding words of how we've, how we've crossed paths over the years and how you've continued to show up. Um, we asked the panel to share a bit about themselves, and that also includes a song that describes their last year of teaching. In Indigenous initiatives, we love songs. Um, we're always using them to pump ourselves up for workshops. And so I wanted to just throw that extra layer of an intro um, to you all and have the panelists share in that way. Ben Chung is a lecturer uh, and Indigenous initiatives coordinator in the Department of Psychology. And he says only been faculty for five years. Um, that's a huge thing, um, but you've been at, Ben has been at UBC through both undergrad and graduate school. And when I asked Ben about the song, he said, as for the song, I'm going to go with NSYNC's Bye Bye Bye. Definitely not the I loved you endlessly part, but definitely the I know I can't take it anymore. It ain't no lie. I want to see you out that door, baby. Bye bye bye. Um, good riddance to this last year. So thanks, Ben, for sharing that part in, and welcome to the panel. Leanne Chen um, is uh, an educational leadership faculty 
in the departments of zoology and botany. And, and she's been here for 12 years, exclamation point. Definitely exclamation point. When asked about the song, she said, it's a difficult question. Her, her first thoughts were tub thumping by Chumbawamba. I get knocked down, but I get up again um, without all the alcohol, of course. And then also the song going through the motions from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, once more with feeling. Um, Catherine Douglas is a sessional lecturer at the Vancouver School of Economics and has been teaching at UBC full time since 2008. Um, the emphasis of her teaching, research, and community engagement is on the roots of change in the economy with a particular focus on sustainable development. This interest in, in the deeper forces determining economic outcomes inspires her interest in the implications of colonial legacies and the need to bring more inclusive and representative lens to the topics in her economics courses. And we've definitely had those conversations over the years. Catherine's song has definitely, that has definitely been an inspiration for her with carrying on uh, with teaching and everything this past year, uh, Strangers by City of Color. So I invite you to put, pop those into your playlist as well, if you have your own playlist. Um, but without further ado, I'd love to turn things over to my esteemed panel um, to, share, to share your thoughts. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, I guess that's me. Um, and, and before I start, I, I do want to recognize the, the hosts, um, especially, uh, you know, Jeannie, Aaron, uh, Amy, and, and Sue, because I can't imagine having done any of this work without them, and they've been very generous and gracious with their time and their, and their energy uh, and, and, their, and their labor as well to, to help guide me and I'm sure uh, everyone else on the panel uh, through everything that we've that we've been learning over the last bunch of years. Uh, I so I'll, I'll start off uh, with the next slide to talk about uh, just my 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 position and my sort of my context within my department. Uh, I <clears throat> I joined the department in in, in summer of 2016. Uh, and the following year, I adopted the, the Indigenous Initiatives Coordinator Service role in my department. And uh, at that time, it was, it was, it was a, a, a weird time for me because I was in one service position in the beginning. And then uh, I felt like I, I wanted something a little I, I, I want to do something, something different. And, you know, when I first became a faculty member, I had asked my uh, then supervisor, because I, I did my graduate school in the same department, I asked my, my then supervisor who was going, and, and I was going to be teaching the same course, teach cultural psychology uh, as him. And I said, you know, what kind of things should I, should, should I be looking out for as a new faculty? And he said, uh, especially in teaching culture psychology, and, and, and he said, "Well, you should probably, uh, uh, you should probably, you know, at least be a little well read in a bunch of different cultural environments and have some good understanding of different cultural ways of doing things, uh, because the questions are going to be asked of you uh, during during lectures and during classes and such." Uh, and in particular, um, I, I, I did ask him about indigenous cultures, and, and he said that uh, you know he has had indigenous students ask him, um, you know, how do you how can you teach culture psychology in uh, in, in Canada without including um, indigenous cultures, and. You know, at the time, um, and I think over over time, there's been more inclusion of that content in, in his class. And certainly, uh, I think at the time it was it was it was more of just the the idea that you know, from the perspective of mainstream psychology, there's not a lot of mainstream work done that involves indigenous cultures outside of maybe a couple of specific individuals. And so uh, it, 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 that, that, 
that question and that conversation with him really helped spur me on into thinking about, so how do I actually do this, especially in a, in a conscientious, respectful way? How do I actually incorporate and integrate more Indigenous content um, appropriately in, in my classes? Uh, and, and that's kind of the, the impetus for me seeking out uh, the, the, the the uh, Indigenous Initiatives crew at CTLT. Um, and, and that was when I uh, attended my, my, my very first gateway um, workshop was when I attended this, this one workshop given by Carlene Harvey, who's one of the Indigenous um, uh, arts advisors uh, who gave a, a, a workshop on how to support the Indigenous students in your classroom. And I actually really appreciated that I hadn't been to any other session that had that, that, that centered the, the, the uh, discussion and the focus on Indigenous students. Obviously, that would make sense for, for that workshop, but it was, it was new to me. Um, and it was, uh, it, it was a session in which I learned a lot from someone who was starting at almost zero. Uh, I, I learned a lot uh, in that session and it made me want to continue on. And so I, I looked for more, more, more uh, opportunities. And once I stepped into this role uh, of Indigenous Initiatives Coordinator, I started talking to different people, um, uh, Indigenous faculty, uh, Indigenous staff. And that's when I also learned that Psychology has one of the larger cohorts of Indigenous students, um, in, uh, as, as, at least in the Faculty of Arts. And year to year has been pretty relatively consistently uh, one of the larger uh, groups of students, uh, one of the larger groups of, of Indigenous students in our, in our department. And yet it seems that as a department, we, we had no knowledge of this. It didn't seem like we, we recognized that that was the case, even though it seemed like everyone else in the know knew that that was the case. And I think that also really highlighted sort of the, um, the, the disparity in terms of who is making up our, uh, our, our student body and what we know about the student body. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, it was still um, a very, because of the size of the, the, the psychology student body, it was, it, it, the, the number of Indigenous students ultimately was, you know, as a proportion, very small. But I think it says something that across university, across the university at the Vancouver campus, um, that, that, you know, among Indigenous students, many of them choose to come and study in, uh, in, in psychology. So that, that's sort of the, the context around which I, uh, I started doing this, uh, started doing this work. Um, and, and, and over time, I've been really appreciative, appreciative of all the, all the connections that I've, that I've made uh, as well. And um, in, 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 in working on these Indigenous initiatives with the, with the hosts, uh, with the CTLT and uh, Indigenous Initiatives crew, it's actually really helped me um, gain a sense of sort of like not just connecting with the academic side of what I'm doing, but to make sure that I also connect with the community side uh, to really have that inform what it is that I do, um, which uh, has led me to uh, communicate with uh, with a couple of uh, community members that I've, I've come to meet in various capacities, um, including Julian Andrews uh, at, the, at the Mount Pleasant um, Neighborhood House. Uh, so I, I, I can talk to you a bit about one of the major projects and undertakings that, 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 we've, that we've done or that we're still doing right now uh, in, this, in the Department of Psychology. Um, we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so what's one of the things that we've been doing is uh, we so I, I created this little indigenous working group in our department and it was it was it's full of 
students. Uh, it was funded, or the work that we're doing right now is funded by the uh, PURE grant, the Program for Undergraduate Research Experience grant uh, from a couple of years ago. And I say a couple of years ago uh, for reasons that I'll explain in a second. Uh, but this is uh, this is my this is my team. Uh, we've had people come and go over the last couple of years just because of you know life happenstance, and uh, a couple of people have now moved on to graduate work uh, that which which I'm very proud of. Um, so uh, in this group we have. Uh, majority indigenous uh, students. It's one of the few spaces in psychology where indigenous students can actually count themselves as being in the, in the majority. And from year to year, like I said, there's, there's changing of, of, of people. Um, um, but, you know, given the nature of the work that the group does, I, I've, be, I've become very protective of the composition of the group. Uh, so the the group is always at least half, if not more, uh, in Indigenous uh, students, and uh, we have uh, we have Indigenous representation from various groups, including uh, Gitsan, uh, Ardok First Nations, and um, uh, and Bonshare Algonquin as well. Uh, and one thing that actually really worked out well for us in this pivot to online learning was our ability to extend our reach into UBC Okanagan as well. So Alex wasn't able to um, uh, get me a, a picture in time, um, but we were able to incorporate at least one, uh, one member of the team from UBC Okanagan to participate in our work to help conduct uh, interviews to help do analyses uh, and to attend uh, these uh, our, our team meetings, our, our semi-regular team meetings uh, remotely from uh, from from her campus. The so 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 the this working group was originally created actually to uh, to as 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 just like a discussion group amongst students who, uh, whether Indigenous students or, in, or non-Indigenous students who are interested in uh, exploring a, more about how, how Indigenous cultures and perspectives can be better integrated into psychology and into the psychology, uh, psychology curriculum. And uh, over time, it's kind of evolved into doing more formal work in this way. But over time, we've, but over the last couple of years that this has been active, uh, we've also done other work. Like we, we've done this, this this series of presentations for each other, where we would go on our own, we would figure out a, a topic, and then we would uh, sort of do a mini presentation of that topic to, uh, to, to, to each other um, or, to, or to the group. Uh, and uh, over, so over the last couple of years, we've done uh, work on things like um, the, the Royal Proclamation. Uh, people have talked about uh, the, the white paper and that's been really helpful for, of course, the non-Indigenous students, but I think it was also really good discussion and uh, some of the Indigenous students actually said that they really, because of the, because of the, the research work that we're doing now, we've sort of gone away from doing that. And some of the Indigenous students have said that, you know, when we move back into in-person learning, really want to start doing that again. So that's definitely something that we're gonna, we're gonna explore moving forward. And uh, one of the Indigenous students in, in this group uh, who had previously been really not sure about their actual Indigenous identity, um, they were just told through their mother's side that uh, they are Indigenous, but not through the father's side, but wasn't really sure um, what exact identity they had. Uh, and, and they said that, you know, through this group through being in this group and talking to other students. It's been really helpful uh, for them and has really uh, inspired them to explore their Indigenous um, ancestry and, and, and identity 
more seriously as well, which uh, which was which was nice to hear too. Um, uh, so uh, amongst this fantastic group of people, uh, the upper left uh, is Melissa, and the the third from the, so second from the right in the upper row, um, the, the 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 woman who's wearing the shirt, strong, resilient, and indigenous. Uh, that is Tara Lynn, uh, and both of them are now um, grad students at UNBC. One of them is in the counseling psych department, is, is, is studying counseling psychology, and um, can't remember what the other person is, uh, what department the other person is, uh, is, is going to be in, but they, they, they just got accepted. So I'm very, very happy and excited for, for both of them. But the, 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 the more formal work that the group has been doing uh, is this project on understanding the experience of Indigenous students in our department. And this really came about because of the conversations I was having with other staff and faculty, Indigenous staff and faculty in the department in, in, at UBC, who all knew about <laughs> what was happening with Indigenous students in our department, except for us. And I thought that's kind of absurd that we don't know anything. Uh, and, you know, we were, uh, I was talking to uh, to one of the other faculty members and, and, and one of the administrative members uh, in a department. And, you know, I was saying things like, you know, we're also not getting a lot of Indigenous students applying for our graduate program either. Uh, and you know, I'm not sure why. And then, you know, they were coming up with all these hypotheses. And I thought, you know, why not just ask them? So I, um, so, so, the, this team and I decided that this this is what we're going to do for the next uh, for the next <laughs> we were thinking year, um, but that was really and we'll go to the next slide to really see what the timeline ended up looking like. So this is supposed to start in 2018 and it was supposed to take a year, um, but that was for me uh, thinking in my really sort of uninitiated mentality. Coming from uh, uh, a, a, a research tradition where things happen very quickly, uh, because in, in, in mainstream psychological research, what often happens is, uh, <laughs> you know, you work with a team, you come up with a design, you run the study, you collect data, you call, and then you analyze it, and then you write it up, right? And in many cases, these these studies take maybe a year, maybe a little longer than a year. But I mean, our directed studies pro uh, projects, for instance, may take, they take a year. And uh, as a grad student, you know, my projects would take longer than a year, but there were also these, always these mini projects that would take no really no more than a year. And then we would sort of build on top of that um, to create a, a larger long-term project. And so I was carrying the same mentality into into this into this this project, uh, and I very very quickly um, realized that that's not the right mentality to to have, and that that kind of mentality just doesn't work in this kind of capacity in this kind of environment. Um, I, I mean, part of it was through you know learning within within the, the, the environment of the indigenous initiatives um, that these kinds of things take time. And then a lot of it was also just organic learning as well, where I, you know, I, uh, going back onto my, my tradition, um, my, my academic tradition, I started, uh, I started with the project. I started with, you know, coming up with a project, working with the team, and you know, creating a whole, a whole uh, ethics application um, and, and, and thinking about what the project would look like. And Tara, who was the, um, who was the project manager at the time, Tara Lynn, who was the project manager at the time before she had to, uh, before she graduated and moved um, uh, to UMBC for her graduate program. Uh, I, you know, I did what I, had originally learned to do, which was create the design, find participants, collect data, and then end of story. So that really didn't work because I, I learned through this process 
And you know, in hindsight, I really should have known better. Um, in, 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 so, so, so what we ended up needing to do was we created the design, sure, but we needed to establish all these relationships with all these members of in the indigenous communities on campus to sort of be accepted um, by those members, by those community members, uh, before we could actually sort of get have the credibility to to be asking indigenous students to to, to speak with us. Um, and and you know I was very thankful um, during this process to have the, had the opportunity to talk to people like Dr. Sarah Lightfoot um, and Dr. Dory Nason and Carlene Harvey and and and, um, and Maggie Moore, you know, faculty members and 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 Indigenous students, uh, arts advisors. They've been really they have been really fantastic in you know in in, in you know, answering our questions and giving us a lot of information about you know things to look out for. And I, I, I honestly, um, I, I felt, I felt, <laughs> I felt bad partway through this process, not, not thinking to do this beforehand. But again, that was from a very sort of uninitiated kind of mindset of just, oh, that's how we do things in psychology. This is how we will continue to do things, or how I'll continue to do things in this group. Uh, so what was supposed to start in 2018 didn't happen until 2019 because of all this relationship building that I was learning that was was, was important uh, to do. And, you know, now uh, carrying this forward, it's sort of become, uh, be become second nature when doing this kind of work to to reach out to community as the first step, as opposed to doing a research design as the first step. Uh, over, so over the over the next year and a half or so, we look to do um, study uh, data collection and uh, and transcription. Uh, we wanted to primarily focus on indigenous students and their experience, but one thing we wanted to do was to to to, to See what kind of what kinds of experience was specific in particular to Indigenous students, and what was more general to psychology students um, at, at large. And so we also decided to talk to a, a small group of non-Indigenous students as well, just just so that there's a, there's a basic comparison to see you know what what different groups of students might have different experiences and might have we might get different takeaways from different groups. Uh, and that data collection process uh, went, it actually went on into the earlier part of this year. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and, and yeah, the, the, with the pivot to online learning um, and to, to doing everything remotely, um, in a way it actually helped because we were able to uh, speak with students. Um, you know, previously we had to speak with students when they were on campus, and that's a very specific period of time during particular days. But uh, with going more remote, students were uh, happy to chat at other times as well, and were more accessible at other times as well. And 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 so that actually made data collection a little easier. So we had uh, we had. Uh, we had group interviews, we had focus groups, we had um, individual interviews as well uh, with, with people who couldn't attend um, the, 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 the group sessions. So now we're at the stage where we are, uh, we are actually, we, we just finished collecting data, we finished, um, uh, we're actually currently doing the last of the transcriptions of the conversations that we've been having with both the indigenous and the non-indigenous uh, students. So we're hoping to start doing some analyses uh, later in the summer and then uh, be able to have a, have a mini report uh, so that we can give something back to the, to the people who gave us the grant 
um, and to my department as well. The, the department head has expressed interest in taking a look at what we've actually been doing the last couple of years. When I originally told him this is this will take a year, and then no, I'm sorry, this will take a little longer. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. The the ultimate goal of uh, what we're trying to do here, this project, is to figure out what, like I said, what's what's going on with Indigenous students in terms of like what's the experience, both positive experiences and negative experiences as well, just, just to get a sense of how how Indigenous students are doing in our in our departments and. The, from from what we've seen so far, the the themes that we've been seeing are things like they definitely feel a lack of connection and, and and community, and a lot of them are asking who who are the other indigenous students, and they'll they'll hear about you know other indigenous students in psychology, but they don't know who they are, and so they don't really know who to reach out to. Uh, and uh, sometimes they'll, they'll talk about a lack of portrayal of Indigenous people, you know, and sometimes they'll, 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 they'll mention, you know, it, in some classes it doesn't really matter. So, you know, things like, you know, talk, taking, talking behavior in neuroscience, they, 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 they don't mind so much that they don't talk about Indigenous people, but in other classes, like in developmental psych or in, in social psych or something like that, um, it's a little strange to, to, to not have any of those kinds of discussions either. Um, and, you know, there's also this, this, this inappropriate portrayals where there tends to be this, this deficit um, uh, centered discussion of, you know, why are they always talking about trauma? There's more than that, right? What about the, the revitalization efforts and such? Uh, but they've also uh, expressed appreciation for the fact that the faculty, the, the faculty members seem generally willing to engage with indigeneity, um, they'd be happy to, to talk to indigenous students about their identities uh, when appropriate. Um, and they've had very good experiences with, with peers uh, regarding their, their, their identities. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, so the overarching goal of what we wanted to do is to create, of, of our working group, is to create a, a good positive environment for indigenous students within the psychology. So what we're really hoping in creating this group is to create a, a, a nice sustainable feedback mechanism and consultation mechanism with indigenous students moving forward where we're going to try to Write up, write up this report. We'll try to fi figure out what kinds of what kinds of solutions can we have to enhance equity in our department as it pertains to Indigenous students. And then we'll go back to the students and, and ask, you know, how would you how do you feel about these kinds of things? And you know, how what what would you do uh, in in this situation? And try to implement some of these uh, practices and, and, and changes um, within the department. So that we can make this a, a, a more um, uh, welcoming capacity uh, for Indigenous students. So uh, that basically sums up the one of the bigger projects that we've been working on. We have a few other projects that we are sort of imagining on our <laughs> imaginary progress board of things that we want to do in the future. But this is the primary one that I wanted to to show all of you uh, that came out as a function of uh, my time in the um, uh, in this uh, Indigenous Initiatives group. Thank you, and I'll pass it on to the next the next panelist. Thanks very much. Well, uh, that was very informative, actually, Ben. I I think we should meet afterward because I think this is something that uh, many departments and schools are are trying to find a, a pathway uh, through in terms of in, uh, integrating Indigenous initiatives and in particular thinking about students and so I know the Vancouver School of Economics is doing the same thing and so it'd be really good to to talk about that um, so what I'm I'd, I'd like to speak to today is is uh, I mean that is a gap that Ben was speaking about but also some of the other gaps that I've come to um, 
recognize through my uh, teaching over the years in particular as it relates to indigenous initiatives and, and why the acknowledgement of those gaps has uh, really spurred me forward in um, continuing to carry on with this work over the, the period of the, the pandemic and, and lockdown, through lockdown and, and uh, easing up and then and locking down partially and, and so on moving forward. Um, so um, I guess we can just uh, go to the next slide, but just thinking about gap, mind the gap, just what we, you might recognize, some of you might recognize the logo of, of that uh, the sign. And I've got the, the logo on each of the slides to, to keep that theme of, of uh, uh, the emphasis of my presentation being the acknowledgement of gaps and gaps in a variety of ways in relation to um, uh, theoretical perspectives, methodological approaches, content, history, uh, in, in especially the focus here is in regard to Indigenous perspectives. And uh, so just my story is uh, to really talk about the, the pathway that I've been uh, following in regard to uh, thinking about Indigenous initiatives and, and uh, how that came to be as I was asked to teach Canadian economic history um, back in 2000. And uh, then I went away and was uh, working on my PhD and came back in 2004. And so I, I actually was asked to teach the wealth and poverty of nations, but I really uh, came to then uh, focus on uh, thinking about those longer term forces of, of change, which was my specialty, economic history. I'm interested in, in, um, in understanding why we have such disparities in terms of, of development outcomes. And, and uh, so uh, that's the pathway that led me to economic history. So in that course on the wealth and poverty of nations, it's really a global economic history course. And uh, then my focus became along with that. I teach quite a variety of different courses uh, and all of them I integrate at least some uh, economic history perspective um, as part of that focus of, of thinking about roots. And uh, so in 2008, um, uh, I once again taught the Canadian economic history course and have pretty much the, the, the faculty member, uh, Professor Don Patterson, who's a retired uh, professor, uh, he, he, I took over from him and adopted the course. And it was a pretty standard Canadian economic history course. And so um, uh, I followed the literature and the, there was a textbook that he had co-authored with his, his uh, colleague, Bill Maher. And, um, but then what, uh, I've come to see uh, over the years, in particular toward the end of the 2000s when we had the financial crisis and then there was uh, uh, some movements, uh, 2008, 2009, 2010, leading up to the Olympics, which was uh, idle no more. And then the context of the, the uh, involvement in the four host nations in uh, hosting the Olympics here in Vancouver. So this period of time, I was really beginning, beginning to question the, the emphasis of what I was teaching in my Canadian economic uh, history class, uh, observing this gap of, of uh, here's this story of really the colonizers, the settlers economic history of Canada and maybe some acknowledgement of the fact that there were indigenous people here previously, but um, not much a representation of uh, indigenous voices and uh, histories in that, uh, uh, in the various textbooks and literature, except for their involvement in the fur trade. And, and uh, it, it's not to say it was entirely absent, but, but really the, the overarching uh, images of Canada's as kind of empty land. And it's been acknowledged in the literature of this, this view um, uh, during that, uh, that period is changing now. Uh, so once I began to realize this really because of what's going out there or going on out there in, in uh, the world and recognition of, of uh, the absence of, of uh, acknowledging uh, colonial legacies uh, I began to determine that I really needed to uh, open up that that box and and uh, 
begin to, as I've put here on this slide, integrate uh, what seemed to be a hidden history. And uh, so uh, began to do that. So, uh, and it's an ongoing process. So how did I do that? That's what the, the story I'm going to be telling. Uh, so if maybe Carissa, you could, you could change to the next slide. Um, you know, and, and part of the dance with this was to, to figure out, well, how can I be truth, true to our disciplines uh, focus? And, and the more I, I I'm very interested in, in uh, ways of knowing and, and uh, uh, different perspectives and, and uh, deeper forces, as I've said. And so first stop is to go like, well, what's the definition of economics? And econ economists, sort of the Greeks was to, it was about managing the home or the house or the place or whatever um, it, it is that one could be uh, determining as the focal point and could even think of that as uh, the management of our, our environment, our, our planet. Um, and so we have micro and macroeconomics. Um, and so what has happened though, is that this, the discipline has developed in ways that has been uh, influenced by different priorities in different periods and by different uh, interests. Uh, and so what we've begin, you know, we can observe is these gaps um, uh, in, in relation to what's relevant, what's meaningful, what, what, is re what, what really should we be looking at in economics um, in terms of subject matter, theoretical frameworks, as I was saying, uh, methods and pra practice. And so if, if we look at the, uh, qu these questions today, they're even at the last week's Canadian Economic Association meetings, I attended a session which was uh, sponsored by the Indigenous Economic Study Group, which is run by out of uh, University of Victoria, fantastic, um, um, uh, initiative that has run through the, the pandemic and kept that kind of connection going, um, uh, where there was a, a, a tension around, well, what defines economics? Who should we be listening to? Should we, some may think that nobody we should be listening to, we should just be looking at the data. So, you know, this is the big question. Does our methodology define the kinds of questions we look at? Others say, no, we should be listening and, and, uh, and uh, determining, are we actually asking the right questions? So, uh, so this has uh, been part of this journey over this past uh, decade, but also in particular, what has motivated me to keep moving forward. So we can go to um, the next slide. And, and this ties into the debates about, well, our, our discipline and the, the emphasis of our discipline. Here we have this uh, Scottish white uh, philosopher, Adam Smith, um, who uh, is seen to be the founder of our, our discipline. And so uh, he wrote The Wealth of Nations where the focus is on uh, competition, self-interest, uh, uh, markets, what are the kinds of forces, the rule of law, uh, in types of institutions that are important for ensuring that the markets are, are uh, unencumbered by government interests and so on. And uh, so he, you know, the, our discipline has tended to be focused on that, but there's also the Adam Smith of his uh, theory of moral sentiments in which he's proposing that human beings are influenced by our capacity to empathize with others and to, to uh, consider those factors in, in our decision making and uh, views of the world. And so, but there's not really been um, so much of a clear reconciliation, you could say, in regard to that. But at the same time, I'm going to, I'm pointing you to these various factors that are influencing my journey over this past uh, time period and, and uh, spurred me onward. Um, and, and, uh, and, uh, it's that question. So I'm gonna hopefully tie together these, you know, make some connections that help to, to bridge the gaps. Um, so as I'm, you know, if we're thinking about this period where I've taken over this Canadian economic history class, also the Wealth of Nations, a global economic history course in this time period, the, you know, 2010, 2011, 12, I'm, attending sessions here at the Center for Teaching Learning Technology and uh, 
classroom climate, I'm starting to recognize there are some gaps in, in what I'm talking about and learning about, you know, teaching about and even learning about in my courses. And, um, and uh, so this is uh, uh, this recognition coming to the fore um, and, and how to, then the question becomes how best to mend that gap. So I'm minding the gap as you know, maybe some of you have been to the UK or London underground and there's the often <laughs> voiced uh, warning to mind the gap. And uh, so this is what has come to my mind. I'm trying to mind the gap and even to see how that gap may be uh, mended. And so next, next slide, please. So there are various ways. Well, first of all, I'd like to point to what has motivated me to, to want to do that a, a little bit more and uh, to be thinking about, of course, the importance of Indigenous voices. I cannot speak for Indigenous people in terms of what uh, their experience is, but you know, what I want to be able to do is to bring forward their voices um, and, so, and, and to listen. That is what I, you know, my first recognition was is that I needed to do a, a lot of listening. And for the first few years, I attended many of the sessions at CTLT. That's all I really did. I engaged with people at the, at the table, uh, but a lot of it was about questions and, and uh, uh, really a lot about listening. And, and uh, as Ben was mentioning, very thankful for the speakers that we had to many of these sessions, the indigenous speakers who um, we were able to, to learn from and, and hear from um, through this, this uh, the Indigenous Initiatives Program and, and uh, the development of the community of practice, which I'm so great to see. Very happy to see that there, there are so many people here today uh, to join in the conversation. Um, then, so I've spoken about the Olympics and raising the profile and then 2013, the university in September of uh, 2013, uh, the campus was closed and we were very much encouraged to attend the Truth and Reconciliation Commission sessions in, in, uh, in, uh, at the PNE. And uh, so I did that. I invited my students to come. Three showed up, and uh, that was such an impactful time for me. It really was a turnaround in terms of what is motivating me is to hear that truth. And it's the truth and the reconciliation is having heard that truth to be a witness to the stories. I can't even speak about some of the stories that I heard at that session that day, but it has, it has carried with me uh, to this time. Uh, other kinds of influences, uh, field trips, engaging with uh, Musqueam First Nations community. We uh, uh, had a, I'm so thankful for the, the generosity of the Musqueam people in, in sharing uh, their uh, history with us, one of, two of my classes uh, where we went to visit uh, the reserve. And then uh, also Kwantlen First Nations in Fort Langley. We, I've had many, many field trips out to that uh, Hudson's Bay uh, fur trading post and, and uh, gradually uh, come to you know, uh, highlight the um, indigenous context of that fort. Then where I wanna just uh, finish off, I've, you know, I've, time is short. And so um, uh, I'll maybe just uh, this image here before Carissa moves to the next slide is just a, the, the house post um, a Capilano uh, uh, created by Brent Sparrow, looking out up uh, English Bay, how sound up into the coastal areas as really a statement of this being the territory of the Musqueam people. And so it is through my collaboration with uh, Janie Liu and other, uh, mainly Janie who, who brought this um, uh, Acknowledging Place uh, workshop uh, that uh, was meant to complement Jordan Wilson's uh, walking tour of Musqueam House Post, which I had uh, discovered in, um, um, in my, uh, the previous year. So just uh, maybe the, the next uh, slide. And uh, so uh, maybe I'll just skip forward a little bit, but just to let you know that we've had this uh, acknowledging um, uh, place 
the idea of this uh, workshop is for students and myself. I have also learned about the importance of, of positionality, of place, of considering where we come from, what are we bringing to any endeavor that we are engaging in, and to be considering uh, what the absence of, uh, of, of place and, and the disruption of place might mean um, in this context. And the assertion of rights, which is really what Jordan uh, Wilson is highlighting. We think that these house posts and, on, on totem poles uh, from the North Coast perspective, uh, but the house post from Musqueam perspective, that they're representing art forms. They're actually statements of property rights of claims to the land, that this land that we are very thankful to be uh, situated on and to learn and study um, uh, is, is uh, their traditional ancestral and unceded land. And so that was a huge wake up call for me uh, and something that I've continued to consider and to integrate as I've moved forward. So I'll just stop there because I know we're, we're short of time. All right. Uh Thank you, Catherine uh, and Ben. Uh, so hi, everyone. Um, I'm Leanne. I am, uh, yes, I'm here to talk about my personal experiences, my personal journey uh, on indigenizing my content. So, so yeah, I joined UBC back in 2009. I was very happy to get the educational leadership uh, faculty position in zoology and botany. Uh, and I have to say, uh, indigenizing my content was not really on my radar until a few years later in 2013, again, with uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada coming to Vancouver to record testimony of the Indian residential school survivors. So UBC had suspended classes on September 18th to allow students to, to allow staff and students to attend events. And we were being asked to speak about Indi Indian residential schools and to add indigenous content to our classes. So now I teach cell and molecular biology classes. And my question was, well, what relevance does this have to the TRC and indigenous residential schools? Uh, and yet, I, I knew that I had to make find some way to make it relevant because the, that's what my students were going to be asking. Uh, they were going to be asking, why do we have this day off? Why, why are our classes suspended? And I wanted them to be able to uh, treat this day with respect uh, and pay proper attention to the, the exercises that they were being given. So this led me to consult with Amy Perot, who was uh, an Aboriginal specialist at CTLT at the time. And uh, next thing I knew, I found myself uh, leading a discussion within the Faculty of Science with my colleagues, uh, Shona Ellis and Pam Callis, to brainstorm and share ideas of this very question. Uh, how do we address this day? How do we indigenize our content? And so ultimately, what I did was I linked Indian residential schools and the TRC to uh, two, two items. Um, the impact of traumatic stress and uh, students should consider, you know, maybe the people around you could be struggling and there, by the way, there are some resources to help you. And then the other issue is, uh, well, we come to university with a lot of hidden assumptions. Um, we also come to university to learn more about critical thinking. So we should use those critical thinking skills to uh, evaluate the evidence, uh, to examine one's assumptions and to evaluate the evidence we have for those assumptions, and then to revise our worldview for it. Like, right? Uh, so we're all about the credible evidence here. Um, so that's how I kind of brought, uh, use this. Uh, next slide. So around the same time, uh, I was I, I came across the Coast Salish wool dog um, in Ravelry of all places. So in case you don't know, Ravelry is basically social media for knitters. Uh, so I have dogs. I have spun and knit a sweater from one of my dogs. So I was really so I was really interested in learning about this. Uh, so the the First Nations in this area used to breed and keep these. Uh, white woolly dogs for their their fiber and they would incorporate this fiber in the beautiful woven blankets um, and so I discovered there's uh, genetic and protein evidence to support the witness accounts of these wool dogs 
And so this was how I could bring some of the indigenous content into my cell biology class. And it was another way to, it was also a way to make the connection uh, to indigenous cultures. And in subsequent years, I've also used this example to encourage students to say, visit the Museum of Anthropology and see an example of one of these uh, beautiful woven blankets and to learn more about First Nations culture in this area. Uh, next. Uh, so this is how I got started. Uh, now, one thing about participating in these TRC events is that I knew that I it, it could not be a token effort. It could not be a one-off. I had to keep at it. Uh, but at the same time, I was struggling to uh, find ideas. So uh, it kind of sat incubating in the back of my mind. Uh, I And I basically tried to attend any sort of useful seminar or workshop, mainly at the CTLC, to try to develop ideas, to see if ideas would spark. Uh, Amy Perot also kept touch with me in that time. Uh, she touched base uh, that, you know, again, kept that idea. It's like, okay, I have to keep on going at this. I have to, I have responsibility here. Uh, and uh, it was, so things finally kind of came together with uh, the design series that Amy Pearl talked about, the Exploring Indigenous Perspectives in Teaching, Practice, and Learning Design. So this was a three-day workshop over um, three months, and it culminated in the development of a lecture outline uh, that, you know, that we would get then get feedback on. Uh, so around that same time, I had also been taking the Tri-Council Policy Ethics Certificate for a separate project of mine. And they did have an example, uh, a, they did have a case study involving Indigenous research subjects. So that was another idea that kind of helped uh, develop the next lesson. So uh, next. So this led to elect a research ethics lecture that I did in my molecular biology lab course. So to do this lesson, I consulted heavily with Janie Liu, also of CTLT Indigenous Initiatives. Uh, so one thing about teaching in science, we're not really used to teaching the heavier controversial topics. Um, I wanted to consult with her about how to cover uh, potentially traumatic case studies, um, like with sensitivity. And I also, it was also important not to, like as Ben said, we don't want to, as well as Ben's students had said to him, uh, we don't want to define Indigenous peoples by their traumas either. So there had to be uh, examples, uh, like more hopeful examples as well. So this lecture ended up uh, highlighting uh, three case studies. So the two of them that were Indigenous are the nutritional studies in residential school children that happened in the 1940s and a UBC example out of uh, medical genetics. Uh, health, health, well, they were supposed to be health studies carried out on the Nutrition Health in the 1980s. And uh, the researcher in question ended up using that data for migration studies instead. Uh, and then I also included um, Henrietta Lacks and Gila Cells, Henrietta Lacks being African-American. So uh, basically featuring marginalized groups in general. Uh, but moving, I also wanted to highlight moving forward. So there's the statement of apology that Santa Ono gave about uh, like basically that we have to acknowledge uh, our sins as well as our uh, achievements, right? It can't just all about be, it can't just be about national pride. We also have to have this nat national wide, uh, nationwide atonement. Uh, and I also talked about uh, more positive research uh, partnerships moving forward. So Laura Arbor, also of UBC Medical Genetics, have had has had this uh, research uh, partnership with the Gitsan. Um, so not just looking at the long QT syndrome, but working with the communities to disseminate the information and to uh, you know help the community live with uh, the diagnosis. And and there's also this concept of DNA on loan that the communities retain ownership of their own genetic data and they get to decide what is done with it. 
So this was a lecture. This, this lecture also helped me stress the importance of protecting marginalized groups and also the importance of diversity and representation among those who do the research uh, that, that determine the questions that get asked, that determine how this research gets done. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, so this kind of, so I was on a kind of on a roll at this point. So I kept on finding more and more resources. So about this time, I also found uh, Kim Tallbear's book on Native American DNA. So Tim, Kim Tallbear is indigenous. She's currently at the University of Alberta. And I also found Alondra Nelson's book, The Social Life of DNA. She's African-American. And the two books together, uh, they make a nice counterpoint to each other. Uh, so the one talks about the conflation of uh, DNA, genetic testing, with blood purity um, and this idea of, you know, appropriation of identity, whereas the other also points out, well, hey, um, DNA can be used for um, reparations and to reclaim identity. Uh, so these are, I mean, these two books alone could be an arts and science course on about DNA and, and identity. Uh, around the same time, uh, so this this allowed me to ask to ask questions of my molecular genetics course. Um, so who gets to ask these research questions? Uh, so the human genome has been completely sequenced. Well, who's the representative in that sequence? Uh, which groups got to be the default? Which is the reference population? How does this lead to disparities in genome-based medicine? Right. Uh, so about that same time, I found that there were projects to address some of those disparities. So there's H3 Africa, there's Genome Asia, and closer to home, we have the Silent Genomes Project to help uh, diversify um, the reference populations. So the Silent Genomes Project, uh, this is a project led by, um, let's see, it's led by Laura Arbor and Wyeth Wasserman of Medical Genetics, Genetics, as well as Nadine Karen, who is the First Nations Health Authority Chair in Cancer and Wellness here at UBC. And so what they're doing is they're seeking to uh, develop a genome database uh, based on the Indigenous peoples of Canada. So this is an ex another example of developing research relationships with Indigenous communities. And like Ben had said earlier, um, they talk about, first of all, they are, have to build the relationships with all the different communities. Um, they're working out how this genetic data is going to be controlled and accessed. So again, this concept of DNA on loan. And they're offering education and um, building research capacity within these communities by offering internships. So this is all good. This is this is these are all good examples that I was able to include in my car in my course. Oh, so next. So yeah, so I can look back after this time, um, and it feels like I've come a long way, but at the same time, I'm still learning. Uh, for example, I've been doing land acknowledgments in my courses for uh, a few years now. But it wasn't until last year that this whole idea of position in place really clicked for me. Um, so I'd been doing, I've done this exercise before where you ask, okay, well, where do you come from? Where do your parents come from? Where do your grandparents come from? And that was always kind of a fun exercise. But it wasn't until last year that it was like, oh, um, we ask that because this is a way to consider where we're coming from. Uh, and where we come from determines our worldview and our values. And that in turn determines what research questions we ask, uh, what research we conduct, what, we, what, what importance we place on it, how we interpret that data. It's like, oh. Um, the other thing was the, the Silent Genomes Project. So uh, I taught that for the first time just before the pandemic. And it's like, oh, hey, you know, look how good we're doing. Uh, we're addressing some of these disparities in genomic uh, research. But then the pandemic hit and it's like, oh, we, we've missed something. Uh, genomics does not replace uh, the, the, like basically there were more acute health needs that became much more apparent with the pandemic, uh, like access to simply, access to, to water, to nutritious foods, to healthcare 
are much more important determinants of overall health. So genomics, we still need to have appropriate representation if you're going to do genomic research, but we can't lose sight of the bigger picture of, of health either. So that was something else. Uh, the next time I taught this, uh, I made sure to include that in the lecture. Uh, so continuing the journey, um, I'm still trying to keep track of all the different resources. I, I, there are so many resources that I'm trying to read, find the time to read. Um, so there's this concept of two-eyed seeing. Uh, basically, it's a way to try to combine indigenous and Western approaches to, to knowledge. Um, there, there are, there's a lot of writing about decolonizing science. Um, it's also been apparent that, you know, from various conversations here and there from my colleagues that they've been up to stuff as well. So, and, and I, we're just not aware of what each other is doing. So this summer, we're going to have a discussion during our biology teaching retreat to share what we've been doing, uh, to learn to learn what everyone's been doing and to, you know, uh, continue this discussion and perhaps spark new ideas uh, and share resources. And I'm also continuing in this Indigenous Initiatives community of practice for the same, for the same reason, to share ideas and, and to hopefully spark new ones within the broader UBC community. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much where I am currently in the journey, uh, looking, looking forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leanne and Catherine and Ben for all of your stories and contributions on this panel.